Welcome to the Air Gun Show. We've got a packed episode this week, including a roundup of guns and gear from the British Shooting Show and a beginner's guide to zeroing your scope. But first up, I make for a roving session in the woods. Right, I'm out for a roving session in the woods this afternoon. Now, moving around isn't usually the most productive way to fill your game bag, but it is a very enjoyable way to while away a few hours. Now, it's also an opportunity to have a look around your shoot, and what I'm planning to do is maybe earmark a few places that may warrant setting up feeding stations for squirrels at a later date. Now, I've also got my bean bag seat with me, so if we find anywhere that looks like being productive, we may give it a bit of a go today as well. With a couple of hours or so of daylight left, I'm out at a prime time when woodland pests should be pretty active. So, I'm keeping my eyes peeled for quarry, or at least for signs of quarry, as I make my way through the trees. Right, now this is just the sort of spot I was referring to. Just up behind me, in the fork of the main trunk, is a fairly large squirrel dray. So they're definitely in this part of the woods. Now, it's also nice and open here. Relative to the rest of these woods, the trees are fairly sparse so there are good views up to get shots and to see squirrels moving around. And if I just walk across to here, there's a perfect tree to set up a feeding station. If you put your peanut feeder up on here, just high enough to be out of the way of the badgers, set up in the cover back in the woods, I'm sure it'll be a place that you could pick off a few. Now I also know that there are pheasant feeders just along this way so we'll move across to there, maybe settle down for a few minutes and see if we can't bag one or two. Right, I've got a nice natural hiding place here. A fairly thick ash tree. If I sit in front of that, obviously I won't be silhouetted and it puts me about 25 metres from a pheasant feeder with plenty of grain underneath it where I hope those squirrels will turn up to feed. This handy feeding station probably won't last long now the pheasant shooting season has drawn to a close. But there's still grain in there now and it's more than likely that greedy squirrels are taking full advantage of it. Right, it's quite cold but weather conditions are actually just about perfect for this kind of ambush. Now some people think that grey squirrels hibernate through the winter but they don't and they will venture out in very cold weather, although they don't like getting wet. Now we've had a few damp drizzly days in the lead up to this session so now that it's nice and dry I'm hoping that they're going to be eager to venture out and get beneath that feeder. As ever, I'm popping on my head net to help me blend in with the woodland environment. A pale face can really stand out in this setting, attracting unwanted attention from your quarry and alerting it to your presence. I'm also going to take the sling off my gun, just to prevent it from drawing attention by swinging or clicking just when I don't want it to. All I can do now is sit and wait in the hope that the lure of the grain will soon get the better of a hungry squirrel. It's not exactly action-packed shooting, but there are certainly worse ways to while away an hour or so. Eventually, a movement on the woodland floor catches my eye, 
and it looks like we've got a diner coming to the grain hopper. This squirrel certainly knows what it's after, but of course, there's no such thing as a free meal. The pellet finds its mark and it's lights out for this greedy bushy tail. Well, we didn't have to wait very long for that one. Nice level shot, really solid smack to the head. That's one in the bag. Although my intention was to keep on the move, I can't help feeling that there's more action to be had from here. So I decide to sit it out for a little while longer. My hunch proves right and I'm soon on to another squirrel. Right, well that one was just shinning its way down the trunk, presumably on its way down to the feeder, and it froze. Now when they're presented like that on your side of the trunk, and they're spread eagle clinging on, like that one was, it's a really good shot to just strike them right between the shoulders. So not worry about the headshot, just plant the pellet right between their shoulder blades, and that gives it a very clear path straight through to the heart and lung area, and it should bring them down nice and cleanly. I give the spot by the feeder a while longer, but in the interest of exploring one or two other areas, eventually decide it's time to up sticks and see what else I can find. Well, how about that for a headshot? That squirrel really wouldn't have known what hit it. Now. This was supposed to be a roving session and as much as I'd love to sit there for the rest of the evening and see if I can pick off one or two more from there, I want to get around and have a bit more of a look around the woods. So I'm going to get that other squirrel picked up, bag them both up and we'll get moving. Right, back to the subject of familiarising yourself with your shoot. There's a sign here of a really busy crow roost. The ground in this part of the woods is just absolutely splattered with these runny white droppings. There are a lot of really tall trees around here, just the sort of trees that crows would like to roost in. Now it's getting around to the time of year when I usually start to crack down on them again. So it really is time for me to start thinking about that the next time I come here. I'm heading across the river to investigate a release pen in the neighbouring block of woodland, a place where I had a few very hectic nights targeting rats last winter. OK, well, this is where I was hoping we would get to before we ran out of light. Now, last year, this release pen was absolutely crawling with rats. I just had several good nights shooting here. One we caught on video, it made for one of our shows. We had quite a busy evening's ratting. So I wanted to see if there are any signs of them here now, this year. And looking at it, it seems to be completely devoid of rats. There are no scrapes, no obvious holes, no excavations, no droppings along the edge of the uh, fencing. So I think we'd be wasting our time if we came here with night vision this year. What I will do though, is sometimes a bit of a pigeon roost around here and there are a few resident squirrels. So we'll settle down here for a little while before we run out of light and see if we can't bag something else. We've not got a lot of light left, but the period around sunset can yield some great woodland shooting, both with roosting pigeons and with squirrels that are eager to get out and feed before night closes in. So I'm going through the usual motions of covering up my face and settling in next to a tree to wait and see what's about. 
The disturbance of our arrival has no doubt put the woodland residents on edge, so it's now a matter of keeping still and letting peace return to the woods. The pigeons don't seem to be putting in an appearance, but as I scour the trees for signs of quarry, I eventually spot a squirrel that's ventured out into the darkening wood. Oh, that one was a welcome surprise. I was scanning up in the treetops and a squirrel had actually come out fairly low down and relatively close in one of the trees that's actually growing up from down in the gully that drops away from here. So it was another pretty horizontal shot. Um, and I'll always take a level shot if I can get one. It's much more easier than trying to work out hold over and hold under when you're shooting at a steep incline. So relatively close, relatively straightforward shot, and that's another squirrel. The evening is really wearing on now, but it looks like we've got another chance at a squirrel that's crept out to feed on the seeds up in an ash tree. Well, I'm well pleased with that shot. That was about 35 metres, and the wind was just starting to catch the tops of those trees. Added to the fact that there were a few twigs in the way that I had to make sure I threaded the pellet through. Now, I think that's a good one to end on because I want a bit of light left to pick up by. Now I'm really pleased with how it's gone though. I've managed to account for a few squirrels. I've also earmarked what looks like a productive spot to set up a peanut feeder later on. And I've also found what looks like a good area to target those crows when I come back for a go at them. I'm a little bit disappointed that there aren't a load of rats around the release pen here. But then again, the gamekeeper's going to be really happy about that. So you can't have it all. More marauding squirrels brought to book there. And now, it's the Air Gun Show News. This is the Air Gun Show News. This week, we report on location from the British shooting show at Stoneley. With air gun, optics and accessories galore populating the NAC's exhibition halls, this event is an unmissable affair for air gunners. We met up with the great and the good of the industry to see their latest products. First, a new rangefinder from British brand Hawk. This is the new Hawk uh, Hunter rangefinder. It's a new addition to our rangefinder family. Uh, it's the compact version, uh, so it's more ergonomic in terms of fitting it in your pocket. Uh, it's pocket size and health size. Uh, it has a system of an auto shut off and also a mode function so you can go from meters to yards, yards to meters. Uh, the system has a, a battery saving option so within several seconds after using it it will switch itself off which will obviously reserve the battery capacity. Uh, there's two models available, 400 meter and 600 meter. There's lots going on at BSA right now. They showed us their new PCP aimed at junior shooters. And this is the new BSA Ultra JSR, which stands for Junior Stock Rifle. It's the only dedicated PCP on the market aimed at the junior age groups, probably between the age of 7 to 12 years of age. The key feature of it is this junior version stock. And when it's outgrown, uh, we'll be able to swap over for an Ultra Stock. Um, it's based on an Ultra platform. Um, arrives in 177 and 22 calibers and will deliver about 120 shots at six and a half foot pounds. Also carries BSA's cold hammer forged uh, barrel which has a muzzle thread on the end um, so a silencer can be fitted as at BSA we believe that kids are already loud enough. For HFT fans, there's a new scope on the market that's packed with innovations. The shooting party's Mike Herney told us more. Uh, here we have our new PAO 10x56 fixed magnification 
target scope. It's designed by Mike Duffy of Airgun Review TV, who's a keen HFT sh uh, shooter. The, the real novelty of the scope is the reticle itself. It features traditional half mil dot spacing uh, in the centre of the scope. To the left hand side, it has a, a graduated bracketed target system so that you can get your aim point very, very quickly in an HFT uh, situation. It's a 30 mil tube scope with a big 56 mil objective lens. There's also a screwing 10 centimeter sunshade for use where the rules of the target sport allow. Quickly dial it in your zero, push down and it's locked. The reticle is also illuminated in uh, green and blue. Blue because some people have difficulty recognising red or green, so it gives those with colour blindness an opportunity to, uh, to use the scope easily. It'll be available towards the end of March 2017, and the all-inclusive price, including the mounts, the 10 centimetre sunshade, is $149.99. And if nighttime rutting is your thing, you should check out the brand new torch range from Nightmaster. This is the new Nightmaster Eclipse. Uh, we listen to our customers. Uh, they they uh, give us a lot of feedback on the older models, and then we uh, we use that to, to develop the, the new range. So both of these are USB rechargeable. Um, the charging port is hidden away in the thread there. It's one press on, one press off. Um, We've got a, a silent switch on there, so there's no audible loud click. You can set the switch to illuminate every time the IR is switched on. We've got a battery indicator, so when, it re when the battery reaches 10% power, uh, it will flash. We've included an SOS function, so whether the light's on or off, you can press the button three times, and that will activate the SOS function. Now that, that you can do that with any of the LEDs. We've got the uh, Eclipse 1000, which is the bigger head, and the two battery tube. Then we've got the, the uh, Nightmaster Eclipse 800, which is a single battery and a uh, smaller head. Now, runtime wise, you'll get three hours from one single 18650 battery. And with the Eclipse 1000, you get six hours with the two batteries. We stopped by the Scott Country stand where there were not one, but two bits of news. Firstly, the ultra versatile new bipod. And secondly, a training system that allows you to record your range work and put a camera down range wherever you are. Brand new to the UK market this year is the Bullseye Target Camera. What this does, it allows you to put this camera down range in front of your target. And having done that, what you can then do is use your iPad back at your shooting position to see exactly where your shots are landing. This camera will basically record shot by shot so you can see the last shot you took rather than having just a load of holes on a bit of paper, it will just flash and show you where your last shot landed. What it also allows you to do is uh, assist you with zeroing your rifle. So if you tell the app that comes free with the camera exactly what your adjustments are on your scope turrets, then from seeing exactly where your shot lands and where your point of aim was, it will tell you what adjustments you need to make to your scope in order to get it zeroed nice and quickly. So effectively, this is going to save you walking 100 yards to your target and 100 yards back. Um, to keep changing your targets when you've got too many holes on the bits of paper, it's just going to let you shoot all day with it. The battery lasts 12 hours and it also works at night as well if you're trying to zero some night vision. So the other product we've got brand new for you this year is the first Ford range of bipods. Um, these come with different fittings for different rifles. So for instance, on this air rifle, we've got a Picatinny rail and the spigot that comes off that. And all that happens is that the bipod then slots onto the spigot there and then it's locked on. Now the Versapod range is, generally speaking, all comes with pan tilt um, abilities, so lots of free movement in it. But as soon as you're ready to take your shot, if you just push the, the gun forwards, it locks it into position. What we are doing the Versapod range with is a thing called Battle Packs. And these come in these fancy molly bags. And they also come with a range of legs. So they come with a ski, ski leg for bench shooting, and also a spiked leg for rough terrain, muddy ground, things like that. And of course, the standard rubber leg. Now also the legs are spring-loaded, 
so you can just push them out like that and then adjust them to whatever height you want. Back to air guns and to the ASI stand where FX unveiled a new Streamline PCP. This is the new FX Streamline. It's a new gun that FX have just made. A uh, lovely little piece of walnut comes in three guises, synthetic walnut and laminated stock. Comes with a shrouded barrel where you can fit an external silencer on it. It comes with a power adjuster, fully regulated, round about the 220 shot mark, so very high shot count. Comes with a side lever cock in action, 12 shot magazine, and again with a dovetail. The long awaited Daystate Wolverine 2 also got its first showing to the air gun mad public. This is the very latest version of the rifle that came out in 2013 and we've updated it for 2017. We've added a new core valve system, a new firing system into the gun. We've made a few small changes to the breech block design to bring it up to date and we're offering it in a cylinder version and two bottle versions. A highlight bottle, which is a carbon fibre bottle, very light, 480cc, and also a conventional aluminium bottle, which is ever so slightly cheaper. The good news on the Wolverine 2 is it's exactly the same price as the Wolverine 1 that it replaces. So we've managed to keep prices under control, despite Brexit and despite the loss of the pound. So we think we're doing quite well. Uh, very nice stock made by Gary Kane. Uh, we've managed to add some features to the gun which weren't available to us before, which is finger groove cutting, which is actually quite difficult to do on CNC machinery, uh, usually bespoke handwork. So we've managed to put that into the stock as well. If it's a bargain you're after, you should get a load of the latest air rifle bundle courtesy of Armex. I would like to introduce the Armex Enfield Seeker Kit Deluxe. As you see, it, it has a 3 to 9 40 scope and it has a backdraft moderator on. And the whole kit is retailing for around 21999 for take. It's a uh, Hamley 800 in 22. It comes with scope and mounts, what you see. What we've added here is the Armex T6 Tactical Torch. I hope you can see that. Tune into YouTube for the fantastic live waterproof test that we did a couple of days ago. You won't believe it. Go to your dealers, buy three. That's all we've got time for. Next time, we'll be off to Germany to report from IWA. That was the Egan Show News. This week, we're taking a look at how to zero your scope. Last year, we ran a tutorial on how to properly mount a scope. It received a brilliant response, plus several calls for a video on how to zero. We finally got round to it, so assuming that you've already watched the first one and have your scope mounted properly, here's what you need to do. Starting downrange, I like to use either paper or cardboard targets so I can see exactly where the pellets are striking. Of course, you also need to have either a sound backstop or a safe fallout area behind. It's also important to try and do the job in calm, windless conditions. Certainly a lot calmer than we've got today, because it's no good zeroing your scope if the wind's pushing the pellet off by several inches. If you're really fortunate, you may even have somewhere where you can do the job indoors. One thing you really want at your end of the range is a stable platform to shoot from, preferably a sturdy bench, because you're not going to be able to properly zero your scope if the gun's wobbling about all over the place. To that end, I also like to have a support for the gun, either a bean bag or a bench rest. Now, if you shoot a recoiling air gun, you need to support yourself rather than the gun because the rifle needs to move with that recoil. But if you're using a recoilless PCP like this one, you can rest the gun completely. Unless your scope has push lock turrets, you'll need to remove the caps so you can get to the dials. These ones are finger adjustable, so I don't need to use any tools but others may have a slot to accept a key, coin or screwdriver so you can turn them. This scope is one quarter MOA, which means that one click shifts the point of impact a quarter of an inch at 100 yards. That translates to four clicks to shift it by a quarter of an inch at 25 yards. 
Direction is marked R to move the point of impact right on the windage turret and turning it in the opposite direction will shift the point of impact to the left. It's the same arrangement to shift the point of impact up and down on the top elevation turret. I usually start with a target about 12 yards away. Much further than that and the pellet can completely miss the target card if the scope is way off. If you are still missing at that range, you'll need to use a larger card to establish just where those pellets are striking so you can shift the point of impact and bring it back to where it needs to be. Start by shooting a group of three or four shots aiming dead at the bullseye. It's better to shoot groups rather than just one shot at a time because that will give you a general picture of where shots are striking and prevent the odd flyer from messing up your calculations. Here the group is a shade low which I'd expect it to be because at such close range the pellet is still below the line of sight after leaving the barrel. It's also off a bit to the left and at this range it's going to need about a dozen clicks to shift it back to centre. So the windage dial needs to be turned 12 clicks in the direction marked R to move the point of impact to the right. After making the adjustment shoot another group to check that it's had the desired effect but don't worry too much about getting it dead on at this range. The next job is to make the gun safe and put out a fresh target at 25 yards so we can see what's happening out there. With the target moved further out it's time to shoot another group and our initial zero in at close range should ensure that it's not wildly off. This one's looking pretty good but it still just needs a little adjustment to the left and upwards. Dial in the appropriate clicks on the windage and elevation turrets and then shoot another group to check what effect it's had and see whether any further adjustments are required. Having your scope zeroed at 25 yards should set you on the road to extracting optimum accuracy from your air gun but it really is just the start and a lot of shooters will then move on to fine tuning zero at 30 or 35 yards or even more. Once you're happy that you've got your scope zeroed in at your favoured range, it's time to shoot groups at 5 yard intervals from 10 yards out to 40 yards or more. Knowing exactly how high or low the pellet is as it travels towards and past the zero that you dialed in will enable you to use the aim points on your scope's reticle to give shots exactly the right amount of hold over or hold under to ensure that they always hit the target no matter how far away it is. That's all for this week, but we'll be back again in a fortnight. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you aren't already a member of the BASC, have a look at their website and check out the benefits you could be taking advantage of through Airgun Membership. Yeah.